What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Barbells and Trails podcast. I am your host, Brett, back with episode number 20. So uh, hopefully this episode sounds all right. Uh, kind of got everything semi-set up. I'm actually recording in the studio right now. So you guys can't see it. I'm not recording um, video format quite yet. Uh, still got to finish up the background and a few things. But if you have, uh, I guess, seen the Instagram, you would have been able to kind of, kind of get um, an understanding of what exactly is going on. And it's it's come along quite well, I would say. Uh, don't have a whole lot left. Basically, just um, basically the main thing is just finishing up the background and little like decoration stuff. But the majority of it's in. The setup is done. The equipment is here besides camera. But other than that, it's it's coming along. And that's one thing why I, I mentioned audio is because I don't have sound paneling in here yet. So I am improvising so that hopefully there does not uh, have an echo come through. I think it'll be okay. I think I can personally hear it, but I don't think you guys are going to be able to pick up on anything like that. So cross my fingers, it sounds good for you guys just as much. So this episode, like I previously promised I think I think I hinted at it I don't think I actually um actually said what the episode was going to be about uh so I guess we're just gonna have to get into it episode 20 is all about the amazing New York Times bestseller finance personal growth book rich dad poor dad i uh i read this book now shit two weeks ago as of recording this i'm I'm recording this a little late because i had issues setting up the audio but we are we're up and running now and it was I say this every time. I, I, I think I, I realized that I needed to get back into reading, but this was an amazing book. It was one of my favorites, and it it has absolutely been ridiculous. And um, I'm definitely going to reread it because it just had a lot to offer, and there was a lot going on. I mean, for the most part, it was fairly simple to take in the understandings, but it was a great book. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a book basically all about the life of Robert Kiyosaki, who grew up in Hawaii with a poor dad, but he had basically an adoptive rich dad and got to see both sides, both point of views, of the world basically through through the eyes of someone like his father who was highly educated with a PhD that was struggling to pay the bills every week or every month I guess and his friend's dad which ended up becoming later on in life one of the most wealthiest men in Hawaii and uh, he kind of was able to learn from both and their situations and take what was meaningful from his childhood and kind of wrapped it all up into this book years later. So let's kind of get into the the childhood of Robert. He actually grew up, I guess, in the poorer side of Hawaii, or at least in his area for what it sounded like. And surprisingly, just because of how the school district was drawn out, he was able to go to the uh, more rich public school and where the families were a lot better off and wealthy just because of the little jot in the school structure or the school districts. He just got, he just happened to get in those other schools. And at a young age, he realized that he was kind of. 
I guess a not a I about said recluse, not necessarily a recruit recluse, but he was secluded from the other kids because he did not have all the amenities these other children did that came from wealthy families. And one day when he got upset about it, he actually came home and asked his dad, how do I become rich? And the best thing that his dad could tell him at the time was to make money. And so his friend, Ed Him, decided to save up all of these empty tubes of toothpaste, which at the time were made of lead. And about two weeks later, his dad came home finding those two smelting the metal, trying to create fake nickels. And that's when he found out that making false money was illegal. Um, and it was at that same time that his dad recommended that he go to Mike's father because he's a businessman and he has several businesses and companies and ask him how to make money and how to become rich. So he did. And because of that, let's just say that's the Mike's dad became Robert's rich dad throughout the story. And one of the main reasons that he took up the offer of teaching these two nine-year-old boys how to become wealthy was basically because they were the first people to ever ask him. He told them as children that out of my hundred and so employees, you were the first people to ever ask me how to make money. So he decided to take them up on that offer and kind of actually, I guess, assist in answering that question and wanted to teach them the lessons of making money and to think like the rich. And there, there's multiple books that I want to read after this, but he basically breaks it down uh, certain times almost into a mindset is how you even look at the world in the sense of when he asked his dad if they could get something, uh, depending on what it is, maybe a toy or something when he was a kid, his father would tell him, I can't afford that. And his rich dad, on the other hand, would say, how can I afford that? Making it not a statement, but a question and allowing your mind to still wander and try to find an answer to that question and become more, I guess, fluid and trying to f come up with money making ideas and stuff like that. Uh, it, it, so we'll, we'll kind of get into this. I, I guess that was like the baseline for how he got started with it. But as he, a child, he started to, he actually started to work for Mike's dad at 10 cents an hour for, for several weeks. The first lesson that he wanted to teach these kids was that the rich don't work for money. And that might seem counterintuitive, and he even said when he was first looking to publish this book that the publishers did not like that because they wanted to change it because it seems wrong. And one of the reasons he says this, I guess, is the rich don't trade their time for money. The rich make money work for them. And one of the first things that he explained after that was he had them work for almost a month, making 20 cents a weekend every Saturday or whatever it was. And he would spend his, his money and he wouldn't necessarily keep, keep it. And then he sat them down and then said, if you really want to listen, I'm not going to pay you anything. So then they basically, he well, he actually, sorry, back that up a little bit. He offered them several dollars an hour. And at the time, because this was in 1957, I think, it would have been more money than what some adults make at an hourly rate. And he basically allowed these children at such a young age to basically take 
fear and emotion and actually control it and not let the emotions control them in the sense of he offered them this money to see if they would react and actually hop on this offer to see if they've actually learned anything about working uh, at that rate and if it's worth just doing the same thing and making more money from it or actually wanting to learn and not make anything and that's kind of kind of what what he basically helped them understand is that it's not necessarily about what you make are you there for a paycheck are you or in that in that category are you there for some change or are you here to actually want to learn something and he kind of wanted to get a feel for if these kids were actually serious considering one was also his son and because of that he basically allowed them to well he didn't allow them he had them work for free for months or not months but weeks and then because of that because there was no worry of money the kids came up with their own way to make money where they started collecting magazines and comic books that were going to be basically thrown away and made their own library and they started making their own money and they had a little side business where they made their own comic book library and you had to pay to get in and the kids in the neighborhood would come and pay to read comic books for a few hours and they actually were able to make more money than they ever would have uh, trying to work for his dad they they made it into such an operation that they actually hired one of their I can't remember which kid if it was Robert or Mike hired one of their older sisters to basically be the librarian and make sure that everybody paid and nobody stole anything and they were able to make money without even being there and they figured that out at a very young age like I said they were nine when the first lesson was taught and they first I guess became apprentices of Mike's dad the quote-unquote rich dad and and I feel like one thing that he changed with these kids and that Robert later understood was he helped these children to understand and classify money differently than what most people do in the sense of most people I can even confess to to people in the middle class and the poor they look at money as evil because all they see is these rich people have money and they don't do I guess do anything about it or all they want is money and they're greedy and they don't care and and money's evil and this and that and I've I've been talked to in that same way where he taught these kids to appreciate it for a different reason and to understand that money is actually power and the more money you have the more opportunity you have and the more you can do what you want and allow yourself to be more free and can supply wealth for generations let alone your family and and everything like that and he kind of made them change their mindset of greed greed isn't necessarily a bad thing you just got to have the right motivators and one of the second things that he was able to teach was lesson two why teach financial literacy and that's one thing that i quickly realized after graduating high school was i was not financially literate I'm still learning, and even Robert Kawasaki would say he probably is as well, because uh, he he still says that he he goes and learns and tries to figure out stuff, and it's it's sad because it's a fault of the education system. School trains people to become employees, not business owners, and entrepreneurs, and how to be self-sustaining and De develop and thrive in a market and one of the main things and one of the biggest quotes which I didn't realize was from this book but I had heard before is it's not about how much money you make it's about how much money you keep 
you can make millions of dollars, but if at the end of the day you don't have any of that money to show, are you really a millionaire? And that's one thing I realized. And I kind of hopped on that opportunity last year where by the end of the year I was able to save about 55 to 60% of my income. This year it's not as high, I will admit, but it is because I fell out of being financially illiterate or what financially literate and the sense of focusing on my finances quite as quite or I stopped focusing on them less to the extent that I was last year and because of that I haven't been as effective in handling my money and one of the main things that he talks about in lesson two with final financial literacy is how people are not taught the difference between assets and liabilities and that the middle class and the poor put money into liability liabilities that they believe are assets unlike the rich that put their money into assets and some of those things are homes cars uh, just regular debt and anything that uh, most people use is considered a liability a liability is what takes money out from away from you monthly an asset brings in money and that can include anywhere from businesses stocks bonds real estate notes uh real yeah realities from music or um intellectual property or anything like that you have to invest in something else and that's the one thing he was taught at a very young age is that the rich have a different cash flow pattern where their assets make them income whereas for the poor liability just turns into expenses and that the poor person gets their money and immediately spends it all on expenses where a middle class person then gets their salary puts it into liabilities like a mortgage car lease credit cards and then also pays their expenses taxes mortgage payment car payment all this and as for the rich, they put whatever income they originally get and reinvest it into assets. And then those assets then turn into income. So they eventually get their money from their assets, not from their main income. And part of it is just what you put your mind to and focus on. Do you focus on developing your list of assets or your liabilities? And one one liability that his rich dad told him the most see as an asset is your home. And I, I had to admit that I disagreed when I first heard this and it wasn't even from this book, but when I really thought about it, it makes sense. It really does. And it's the same thing as a car, a car in a way can be an asset as it allows you to get somewhere to make money. But in the long run, it, it is a liability that you have to put money through. And a house is a liability because it does not make you money. The way a house can make you money is if you invest into rental properties where you're getting monthly rent to pay down the mortgage and cash flow on top of that. That is an asset. As for a home that you just pay off over time, that is a liability. You will work for three people your whole life. The company you work for, benefiting the company and your boss by making profits for them. The bank, if you owe debt, because you then have to make that income to then pay off your debt. And the government, because you get taxed on your income before you even get to see it. And those are the three three things that you always have to pay 
And depending on how you structure your life, you can cut those numbers back, definitely. Uh, but yes, he the main thing that he says was financial literacy and the importance of just learning how to handle finances. And the main thing is understanding assets versus liabilities. If you put your money into assets, you will then eventually become wealthy. If you put all your money in liabilities, you will stay poor. Lesson number three, mind your own business. Focus on yourself. Focus on your business. What is it? He, he quoted in the book asking someone what their business was, and they told him that they were a banker. So he asked them if they owned banks, and they said, no, I work at the bank. And he said, right there is the difference. You're talking about your profession not your business. A business is something you don't make income off of. It's separate. You work on your business to then hopefully become something like an asset or a company, but it is not your profession. Your business can pr become your profession, but it's not how you work for your money. And the focus of it is to Focus on your business. Don't don't get into other stuff. Don't get wrapped up into your own comp like your job and this and that. Focus on your assets. If you focus on repeatedly putting money in, eventually that money will come back to you in some way or another. If you focus on your business and not your profession. His whole idea is to put your money to work because your money can work twenty four seven and can work forever if you allow it to when he would put money in his asset column he would never take it out because that money is going to work because it's better for his money to work all the time and not him work all the time and i had that same mindset and i'm growing and developing it even more as i hopefully take in more information from reading books and doing stuff like this i find this book quite amazing and i've heard about this book for years and i wish i had read it sooner some of the things i originally watched on financial literacy ended up being some principles from this book and it, I, I mean it's because it's so universal because it can be applied to absolutely anyone anyone can take these steps to move towards financial freedom in the long run and to become wealthy or rich lesson number four the history of taxes, and the power of corporations. So in this, he talks about how taxes are probably one of the worst killers towards the middle class. Because you typically spend the first three and a half months of the year, all that money, all that income you technically make, basically goes to paying your taxes. And after 40 years, that kind of equivalent to, I think those are the right words, six years of your life six years of your income going completely to the government to pay your taxes and that originally taxes weren't a thing the united states didn't have taxes for a long time and it was actually the middle class that voted for taxes because they thought it was going to apply to the rich and in all reality there's more people in the middle class than there are in the wealthy class so who's going to get the blunt of that? Because there's more money to be made off of the many than off of the few. And one of the ways he talks is you got to use taxes to your advantage. you got to learn how to take advantage of them. And in that way, you got to use corporations or like corporations do. You should make a corporation depending on what it is you're working towards. Because if you do, it allows you certain benefits and tax loopholes where you can actually use your money and income pre-taxed as an expense to pay whatever, for whatever it is you need. And in all reality, it's you're basically you're, you're using the money before it's ever taxed. Kind of like a 401k in the sense of all that money is being invested before it ever gets taxed because it won't be and it's kind of the same thing corporations can do that 
That's why some corporations, before the end of a quarter, before tax season, will go spend a lot of money if they've made a lot of money because it's less money for them to be taxed on and then it would be reinvested in the company or in an expense. That's the difference. you got to understand the flow of the money. One of the things that you said that's very important when it comes to the power of corporations and taxes is just increasing your overall knowledge in things. And and the, those knowledge points was anywhere from accounting to investing to understanding markets and then just the law so you know how to use the taxes properly because all of these things can both help you personally and help you in setting up a business or a corporation to then benefit the, the most because if you increase your knowledge in all these fields you will eventually be able to take the benefits from that and hopefully create wealth for your family lesson number five the rich invent money use your mind find opportunities the rich hop on opportunities or ideas or anything they use their mind and that's one thing in this book that his rich dad taught him i feel like the most and that was reiterated all the time was your mind is your most powerful asset. If you change the way your mind looks at things as a challenge and you keep growing, this allows you to then see opportunities more often or find ways where you can possibly build a business where you don't even have to be involved and you're just there making money without even being present. And it it's what has allowed many to become wealthy. It's finding opportunities where others don't. There's a quote from the book that says, in the real world, it's not the smart that get ahead. It's the bold. So yes, you need to be educated well enough, but if you sit back and just watch everything go by, you're going to miss out on many opportunities where you could have the chance to make money and become wealthy. That could be in anything, business, real estate, stocks. If you just sit back and never get involved, you're never going to get anywhere to begin with. So you got to start somewhere and find that opportunity that interests you the most and just hop on that and do what you can. It's it could It could be anything you put your mind to, but allow that opportunity and don't pass up on opportunities. Learn from them. Lesson six, work to learn. Don't work for money. You need to learn through experiences. So this then broadens what you know to then hopefully use that information you learn to make money in the long run. He had several jobs as a young man in the military for a sales company and a bunch of other things that he used to his advantage to learn different things. He learned about tr- like international trade. He learned about sales. He learned about marketing and, and how things worked. He used those opportunities to basically get his foot in the door and learn about certain industries that he would then use later and use that information to make money. And that's something I've had to realize in my own life that I need to probably do this a little more. I need I need to I need to use my job more as a learning opportunity, not necessarily a way to make money. And and in the book, which is very interesting, is that he he sees job, J O B actually means just over broke so when you focus on just the job because of the money you're never going to get anywhere you got to then look beyond that and not be emotionally tied to your income to your job to the security because eventually that's going to slow you down on opportunities like in the last lesson to actually get somewhere and you don't want that. You want to be able to 
try to be flexible enough to hopefully grow into something and become something amazing. Lesson number six, overcoming obstacles. He lists five obstacles to eventually overcome. Fear, cynicism, laziness, bad habits, and arrogance. Fear is also the fear of failure, the fear of losing security, the fear of just think things not working out. Sometimes even the fear of success because you don't know what that's going to bring. It sounds like that wouldn't be a thing you have, but it, it definitely can be. And cynicism is self-doubt, not believing in yourself. Like I said, I think there's more to life than we realize about mindset and perspective and how you actually look at opportunities or situations or how you feel about yourself and what you can do. If you have too much cynicism, it's it, it's going to be detrimental. You at one point have to have that self-confidence to at least go try. And if you don't hit it on the mark, you at least would were able to use that opportunity to then learn and grow. It might not be a bullseye every time, but at least you're aiming at the target. That's all that matters. Just because you miss doesn't necessarily mean anything. You're still learning. You're still taking that initiative. That's what's important. Laziness, I feel like we all all deal with. I deal with it every day at one point. Just just yesterday, I didn't want to go to the gym. I had to psych myself up to go to the gym. I mean, yesterday was Labor Day, and so it was a day off. I was out of my normal routine. I had to talk myself into going to the gym. But once I did, I felt great. I was there for about an hour and a half, and I was pumped and psyched and ready to go. And at one point, you just got to get in your head and understand how do you use your time what's what what's your time worth are you gonna use your time to sit there and binge watch netflix are you gonna use your time to learn and read and watch go to a seminar read a book watch a video about something educational uh work do do anything like that bad habits it's something we we all got to work work on and overcome and change because you can't necessarily get rid of them if you've listened to our past episode about uh atomic habits there's so many things that overlap in life and it's like just slowly but surely learning these perspectives you understand the importance of all these things just in reality and the effect that they can have on everything and that's one of them arrogance another quote from the book robert says every time i've been arrogant i lost money because i believed that what i didn't know wasn't important arrogance is a a natural feeling feeling that you already know enough or that you don't need to know this or that and we talked about that a little bit in the 12 rules for life the meaning of life, that yeah, the 12 rules for life, where arrogance can be very detrimental because it allows you to miss out on possible learning opportunities and self self growth, and that it, it's very important to kind of step back and understand that you don't not you don't necessarily know everything, and you gotta learn from anyone, and it, it's very 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 important. 10 steps to awaken your financial genius. So these are basically 10 steps that he kind of lists that are basically implied throughout the book that he talks about are very, very important to working towards your financial freedom and to basically get out of a rut. It's not be the majority. And we're going to get into those. Number one. Find a reason greater than reality. Basically, you just need to find a reason to become financially free. He he said it in the book. 
at one point you have to be selfish because if that what drives you if if you want to be financial f- financially free if you want to be able to travel if you want to be able to live where you want you want to be able to do this and that then that gives you something to work towards you might have to be selfish but it it gives you that motivation to really want to grow and learn and and hop on these opportunities to see see what it is that's really there and how you can get to your goals faster it's not always bad to be selfish especially if it's trying to push and work you towards something you desire step two make daily choices this is all a kind of relates back to atomic habits you gotta choose every day to make the right choice to to read the book to go to the gym to network and to talk to people to go have these conversations to to actually invest time into something that's worthwhile instead of just sitting back and doing nothing you have to make those choices every day to get one step closer to what it is you're working towards and that could be anything and you got to realize that on your own but you got to try to be a little better every day because it's those daily choices that make the difference in the long run consistency is key and it does not matter what it's in financially educationally physically mentally health wise it it all matters if you can stay consistent that's the most important thing in the long run if you have a few days where you fall out yeah it's okay but you can get back on track and it's just important to get on track sooner than later and not to fall back into old habits where you don't work towards something that's better than yourself or bigger than yourself possibly step three choose your friends carefully we've talked about this in other podcasts as well the people you surround yourself with are going to have a large impact. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to cut people out of your life that aren't working towards the same things, but at least choose to learn from their situations. Robert talks about having friends that are poor and learning from mistakes they make, and he's still friends with them, but he's also has friends that were very wealthy, and it's not necessarily he wants to be around those people because he expects money. But most of the time in a situation like that, if you have someone that's wealthier and knows more and you have someone like yourself that comes in that has that drive and determination and you want to reach that, it's very likely for those people to want to at least help you and point you in the right direction and support you because they want to see you thrive. So it's very important to understand who you surround yourself with because it can have a very large impact of your future and what it holds. Step four, master a formula and then quickly move on to the next. It's better to be a master of, ah, shit, I'm messing up the quote. I'm sorry. uh, It's better to know a little about a lot than to know a lot about little. There's better ways (laughs) that works, but basically... You want to try to learn and know, have basically have a broad spectrum of knowledge. You don't want to be a master in one field because that makes you reliable on that one thing. If you go too far into one sector and that's the only thing you know, it's a lot harder to get out. But if you keep yourself broad and you know a little bit about a lot of topics and a lot of subjects... It allows you to be adaptive and to grow off of all of them. And I feel like that's kind of what he's following with or following with with step four is once you learn and understand one situation, move on and try to learn something else that you don't know and just keep doing that. Keep growing the knowledge base and growing the information you have. Because it's only going to lead to hopefully future money and opportunities down the road. Step five, always pay yourself first to enhance your self-discipline. 
this is one thing he says, and yes, it's hard to believe, but always pay yourself first. His rich dad said that he would pay himself even if he had debt or other people to pay because it then motivated him to find ways to produce and make more money. And yeah, that's might feel a little stressful, but it makes sense in some way or another. It's like sometimes when you get your money, put that money in your assets, save, invest before you then take your money and put it into food and your rent and your taxes and all your expenses set up a, a set up an automatic transfer as soon as your paycheck comes in to go into your Roth to go into your savings to go into something else and don't touch it and just move it don't think about it live off of what you have and that is it that's what I did last year and that's what I'm starting to do more now I kind of fell out of it, but it's very, very true, and it makes you live to that challenge, and because of it, it's going to help you in the long road. Is it going to be a challenge to basically practically live paycheck to paycheck in the sense of having to still pay your expenses but not live off of a lot within the next couple weeks or something, depending on your income? Yeah, but at least you're putting the money into something that's important to you. You're paying yourself. You're putting it into assets that eventually will help you in the long run to get out of the rat race. Step six, pay your brokers well. It's important to have someone that knows more than you don't. It's it's that arrogant thing. It, it's very important to pay someone that's going to help you make money. If you have a broker that helps you set up real estate investments, if you have a broker that helps you set up stock portfolios, it's worth it to pay them well, or even someone that handles your taxes, like a CPA. It's worth paying them well because it's way better to pay them than to pay for a fuck up down the road. Because if you messed up on your taxes, or you messed up on investment, or you didn't get the right information, and you lose tens of thousands of dollars because you were too arrogant to go pay for someone that knows what they're doing, that's a big mistake, and that's going to cost you. It's better to just pay someone up front that knows what they're doing than try to necessarily always figure it out on your own and lose money in the process because of some simple mistake. Go to the experts. Step seven, be an Indian giver. I have to admit, this is the one, <laughs> this is the one thing that confused me in the book. And I think it was basically saying that when the Indians and the pilgrims were together, the Indians gave blankets to the pilgrims and the pilgrims mistake them as gifts and decided to keep them. And the Indians were upset, but there wasn't much they could do about it, so they kept them. I think this basically means that when the opportunity kind of arises, and if someone kind of just lets something in some way befall on you, like uh, an opportunity, a business, an asset, land, anything, just kind of... Take it and t- take it for what it's worth and and get what you can out of it. Step number eight, use assets to buy luxuries. Don't take your income to go buy that car. Invest in what you need to in assets to then be able to afford the car you want. Invest in those assets because they're going to pay you in the long run. It's better for those assets to then afford those liabilities or not those liabilities, but they will be those luxuries than for you to then just pay for them outright from your income. Assets are the most important thing you can use. And if you use it properly, you will be successful. Step nine, choose heroes. Find find anyone to look up to. Find a mentor. Look Like you look up to Robert Kiyosaki. If you look up to Tony Robbins, if you look up to Alex Hermosi, Grant Cardone, any of these people, which I guess in a way I look up to all of those people that I just named, it, it's good to have heroes to learn from because it gives you a chance to build off of the knowledge they've accumulated. 
Step 10. Teach and you shall receive. One of the things that his rich dad instilled in him was generosity, both generosity and money, time, knowledge. Because whatever it is you want in the long run, if you give it, it's likely to come back to you in return. If you donate money, if you give to charity, if you do this and that, eventually money is going to come back to you in some form or another. And he's not necessarily saying that give all your money away because things will work out. But it is great to give because you got to give now even when you don't have money. You can't just wait till you have money to give. And it allows you to just feel better. It's like that's a, that's a, that's a proven fact. But not only that, but teach people. If there's something you know, offer your knowledge for them to then learn because they might know something you don't. Teach Teaching and you shall receive because if you teach someone with something you know, in some way, with how the world works, something might come back to you that either, whatever it is, if you put good out into this world, something good will probably return. Getting started. So <laughs> there's a few things he talked about and getting started. I feel like some of the main ones from the book that I kind of took was in general, you got to change your mindset perspective on how you look at money, how you look at challenges, insecurities, fear, and you got to change those into something that can be worthwhile. Another one of those is, like we talked earlier, controlling your emotions. If you can control your emotions in certain situations, it's going to allow you to take risks that might be necessary in the long run and that involves even the stock markets like just putting your money in the stock market's a risk but to be able to not let the motions control you and to actually let your thoughts and be logical with it allows you a larger chance of success stop and assess what is working and what is not at one point you need to step back and look at what you're doing and see if it's actually working for you. And if there's something you can do to change it, or if there's something you don't like, to get you into a different situation and to keep moving. Look for new ideas. Like, like we said, keep an eye open for new opportunities because you never know what's around the corner. Be aware and, and just be open-minded and just keep learning. Find someone that has done what you want to do. Find someone locally that has been successful in something you're curious in. Get, take them out to lunch uh, <laughs> and learn. Like There's several situations and examples he used in the book where there was someone that had knowledge and knew how to do certain things that he wanted to know and be successful in. And one of the things he did was he offered lunch to him and sat down and talked. And because of that person, they, he was able to learn and get a step in and network and basically grew an asset off of that just in the sense of knowledge and the connection that then made him a lot of money. And sometimes it's worth If there's someone that knows what they're doing and you kind of aspire or look up to them or you want to do something similar talk to them sit down get their attention and sometimes it might just be giving them a call and saying hey i'm i'm interested in getting so and so i'd love to take you out to lunch uh, i know you you're involved with this i would love to just pick your brain and and get an understanding for it and you never know where that's going to go like i've said several times another one was keep learning just keep taking in information, going to seminars, listening to lectures, watching videos, buying documentaries, courses, uh, reading, anything that builds your knowledge because knowledge is, a, I would say, the most powerful thing you have because it allows you to use what you've collected over 
uh, eventually a lifetime and, and that's where you get wisdom like as as an, uh, as an old man as because of hopefully collective knowledge of everything you've done and if you allow yourself to learn about more opportunities you might find different avenues to make money that you did not know previously make offers you have to start somewhere and one of the things he talked about is he's seen people that say they want to get into investing and get into real estate and this and that and they never actually made an offer part of it is just taking that step to do something and making offers is half of the battle at one point shop for bargains in all markets people will chase sales at stores and they will switch stores when prices go up but when the market crashes or we're in a recession or the bubble pops in real estate people stay away and run and don't put money into it you got to understand there's opportunity in all markets and then at a discounted price it's always worth to put your feet in try getting a one up on everyone else you got to see opportunity in every situation profits are made in the buying not the selling that was one that he said near the beginning of the book that i did not understand at the time and it was actually listening to the book i'm reading now that allowed me to understand you especially with real estate you make the money well actually in all opportunities you make the money when you buy not when you sell when you sell is when you possibly get your money back but it's when you buy and the importance of that is in the sense of you let's say you have a house that is is worth a hundred thousand dollars you could pay that hundred thousand dollars and hope that it goes up because of inflation and appreciation or you can go for a house that's worth a hundred thousand dollars and try to buy it for 80 and in that sense if you do and the house is worth a hundred you just made 20 grand on paper and it's in that sense where you made money when you were buying, not when you were selling. It's always the opportunity up front. Same with buying stocks. If you buy stocks at the peak, you're not necessarily going to make money when you sell. If you buy stocks in a recession, when things low, you're buying things at a discount. It's going to be worth more when you sell, hopefully. And it took me a second to fully understand that, but it's a great concept. Make sure to learn from history. Learn from past mistakes from others nearby. Learn from actual history. See see what is what's something to keep an eye on. Like history is one of the greatest teachers and it's something that is I feel like misrepresented or not misrepresented, but it's not always done and history is forgotten and repeated. So if you actually learn from history, you can have a one-up on many situations. And then, last but not least, action always beats inaction. If you don't do anything, you're not going to get anywhere. Simple as that. If you can't take that first step, it's going to be hard to climb up that mountain. And it might be scary, but it's something you're going to have to work through because... No one else is going to do it for you, and you got to take that leap. might be a leap of faith. You might be doing something that you're not even sure about, but at one point you just got to go into it and hopefully figure it out. I did really enjoy this book. It's probably one of my favorites. I'm definitely going to read it again. I 100% recommend anyone to read this. I would say at any age, especially someone that's younger, in their teens and early 20s, because some of these concepts and principles and philosophy at one point are very important to how you can possibly build your wealth and become 
one of the rich. Poor is a mindset. Broke is temporary. You got to use those opportunities where you have them. But I do hope you guys enjoyed this episode. It might be a little shorter than the last. I really don't know. (laughs) It's kind of late for me. I'm just kind of getting it through, getting it out. But I I did enjoy this book. I know that some of these concepts are going to be brought up later on in this podcast. I can guarantee that because it had such an impact on me. And there might have been stuff I missed. And maybe I'll reread it and there'll be different things I bring out. But I'm I'm excited to see where this podcast goes in the next couple weeks. I've got big news um, that I'm not going to let you guys on or into yet. Uh, have ideas for the podcast and stuff that I eventually want to do. Hopefully the studio is finished within the next two, three weeks, cross my fingers, and from there we can start putting out more videos, not more videos, but actual video, not just audio, and do stuff with that, and I have plenty of ideas, can't wait to get the studio finished, I hope you guys did enjoy it, and if you did, please subscribe on the YouTube channel, Follow on Instagram, follow on Spotify, like and comment. And I will see you guys all in the next one. I'll see you next week. Peace out, everybody.